The laws of thermodynamics were originally discovered in the context of ordinary matter, but they apply equally well to electromagnetic radiation. In fact, some of the greatest advances in physics have occurred because of the application of the laws of thermodynamics, the zeroth, first, second, and third laws, to electromagnetic radiation, which is produced when charges accelerate. In this lecture, we're going to briefly talk about the importance of black body radiation, which is, in fact, radiation emitted by atoms in some material. And then we're going to apply what we learn about black body radiation to learn a lot about astrophysics and even cosmology. In astrophysics, we learn how to estimate the temperature of heavenly bodies, of the sun, of the earth, of distant planets. And then in a very surprising move, we'll move from there to the universe as a whole. Because the universe, as you know, started off as a Big Bang. And that Big Bang led to the emission of black body radiation, which, as the universe expanded, cooled and cooled, and is present today in the form of cosmic microwave background radiation. So what does the expansion of the universe, which is governed by Einstein's equations, have to do with classical thermodynamics, that which was discovered a hundred years or more before Einstein was born? These are things that begin with our understanding of radiation and the black body. We all know that black absorbs well, white reflects, and drawing upon this daily experience, we define the ideal black body. That idealized body is one that absorbs all incident radiation. So no energy is reflected back. Here's a simple model for a black body. So imagine that a ray of light comes in, it bounces inside. Each time it bounces, it gets a little weaker because it's absorbed whenever it strikes the object. And then eventually it becomes so weak that none of it is able to get out. Now, of course, no physical body can ever be a perfect black body. It cannot possibly absorb all frequencies of radiation. As you know, light goes from deep infrared to ultraviolet, but there are frequencies far beyond the ultraviolet, and there are frequencies that go down from infrared all the way to zero. So you would expect that at each frequency or wavelength, the fraction of energy absorbed could be different. So, for example, suppose you take sunlight, pass it through a prism, then that light breaks up into different visible colors, all the way from red to orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, purple, and beyond. Now, imagine that you were to pass each one of these colors through some absorbing material. Well, if you pass red through that, then maybe something like 43.1% of the radiation gets through, but if you pass green through it, more of it gets through, and if it's purple, then less of it gets through. Basically, an absorber has got atoms inside it. When the incident electromagnetic wave comes in, it shakes up those atoms. Those atoms then re-radiate light of the same frequency. However, some of the incoming radiation could get converted into random motion and contribute to heat that is absorbed within this material. How much radiation ultimately manages to leave depends very much upon which atoms constitute the absorber and how they are bound together within that material. Of course, if this was a perfect black body, then none of this radiation would be able to come out. It so happens that the best absorber of radiation is also the best emitter of radiation. 
So imagine that light comes in of some frequency. Well, if this is a black body, then all this incident radiation is absorbed. This body will then heat up. It's absorbed energy and then it will radiate light and that light will be of all different frequencies. There'll be, of course, the incident radiation frequency as well, but every other frequency will also be emitted, although the amount of each radiation will depend upon the frequency and how much this has been heated up. Thermodynamics says that if you have a cavity and within that cavity there is a hot black body and some distance away there's a cold hot body, then eventually the hot black body will lose energy through its radiation and the cold hot body will absorb it. Eventually they will both come to the same temperature. The amount of energy that is radiated by a black body at different frequencies is actually predicted by the use of statistical mechanics and in 1900, Max Planck derived his famous formula, which tells you how much energy is radiated at a given frequency omega. This is a formula that led to the beginning of quantum mechanics, and you can see that it involves a constant that is known as Planck's constant, h, or h bar, which is h divided by 2 pi, we will look at this formula in a little more detail later, but let me tell you what these different symbols mean. Epsilon of omega is the energy radiated per unit area of this black body per second in the frequency interval between omega and omega plus d omega. Now you may have seen a different symbol used for frequency, nu, which is the number of cycles per second. If you multiply it by 2 pi, it is more convenient, and this is called the angular frequency omega. h bar, as I've said, is the Planck's constant. c is the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. kb is Boltzmann's constant, and you see that kb always comes with the temperature t, and this T is the absolute temperature in degree Kelvin. Now let's look at a little portion of an area on this black body. So it could be here or it could be here. Then this small area, let's call it dA, will make an angle theta with the normal to this surface here. And the small solid angle that is subtended will be called d omega. This small piece of the black body will be radiating equally in all directions. And so if you want the total power that is radiated by this very small infinitesimal piece of area, then you will have to integrate over all solid angles. Now let's look at this formula in some more detail. The first thing to notice is that as omega goes to zero, epsilon also goes to zero. Well, is that obvious? Not quite, because as omega goes to zero, of course, this goes to zero, but then e to the zero is one, and so we are left with one over one minus one, and therefore we have to be a little more careful. And that can be done by noting that this is of the form x cubed over e to the power x minus one. Now, Suppose that x is very, very small, then e to the x is 1 plus x. The 1 and the 1 will cancel, so you will have x cubed divided by x, which is x squared, and x squared goes to 0 as x goes to 0 itself. And so therefore, what I've said over here is true, that for very, very small frequencies, epsilon also becomes very, very small. What about the other limit? Let's look at what happens when omega, the emitted radiation frequency, becomes larger and larger and approaches infinity. In that case, it's easy to see 
that epsilon will also go to zero. So look at x cubed over e to the x minus 1 as x becomes larger and larger. Of course, x cubed goes to infinity, but e to the x goes to infinity much, much faster. If you want to be absolutely sure about that, then use L'Hopital's rule, that is to say, differentiate this until this becomes a constant. Do the same for this. Differentiate it once, twice, thrice, and you will get a constant divided by e to the x, and now that goes to zero as x goes to infinity. So, if you put this formula into a computer, give it the value of the Boltzmann constant, the value of h bar and c, this is the graph that you will get out from it. What we note over here is that at lower temperatures, there's much less radiated energy. But as we increase the temperature, so now it is 150 degrees, there's more radiation. At 200, there's still more. At 250, and finally at 300, there's still more radiation. Furthermore, the behavior is exactly what we predicted. That is to say, for small values of omega, epsilon goes to zero. Similarly, for large values of omega, epsilon becomes zero as well. It is exponentially decreasing as omega increases. Here we have plotted energy as a function of frequency, but sometimes it is more convenient to use wavelength. The two, of course, are very easily related to each other. The angular frequency and the wavelength are related through this equation over here. So basically, omega is 1 over lambda. Now we can re-express this epsilon, the energy radiated as a function of frequency, and write it as energy radiated as a function of wavelength, in which case it becomes this. Now, what happens if we ask for the total power or the total radiated energy per unit area per second? Let's call that E. Well, then we must integrate over all wavelengths, wavelengths that go from zero all the way up till infinity. So very, very small wavelengths, which means very, very high frequency all the way to zero frequency. And then we must integrate over all solid angles too, as explained earlier. If you do this integral, then you get what is called the Stefan Boltzmann law. E is equal to sigma t to the power 4, where sigma is called the black body constant or the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And the remarkable fact is that this formula was derived long before the Planck formula, which means long before quantum mechanics was even thought about. However, we didn't know what the value of sigma was in terms of the fundamental constants k, b, c, and h. When Stefan and Boltzmann discovered this law, they simply took this as some constant which was to be empirically determined. In fact, it has been checked experimentally that the empirical value, which is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared per degree k to the power of 4 is not very different. In fact, it's almost the same as the theoretical value which is given over here. The important thing to notice over here is that the radiated power per unit area goes as the temperature to the power 4. So even if one body is only slightly hotter than the other one, the power radiated can be much more. There's also another important fact that follows from the Planck formula over here or the formula over here, which is that these peaks can actually be calculated very easily by taking the derivative of epsilon as a function of omega or, if you like, as a function of lambda as well. So epsilon of omega peaks when the derivative is equal to zero, derivative with respect to omega, or equally when the derivative with respect to lambda, the wavelength, is equal to zero. So 
In fact, if one actually takes the derivative over here or over here and then solves for the value of omega at which the peak happens, so the peak is here for this temperature, the peak is here for this temperature, if you do this calculation, and I'm afraid you have to do this numerically, then you find that the value of the wavelength at which the emitted radiation is maximum goes down as 1 over the temperature, and there's a constant up here. That constant you can find by solving that equation here or here, and it turns out to be this. Equivalently, you can find that the frequency at which the peak happens is 2 pi, and there's a c missing over here, so it's 2 pi c divided by lambda peak. This formula is very, very important in astrophysics. Let's see why. Suppose we want to know how hot is that star up there? Well, there's a lot to be learned by simply looking at hot things on Earth. Take a bar of iron that's been heated up in some foundry when its temperature is about 600 degrees centigrade, it's barely glowing red. But then, as you heat it to 700, 800, 900, and all the way until it is glowing white, you see the temperature changing from faint red to dark red to cherry red, on to yellow, and then bright yellow, and then it becomes glowing white. Wien's law is telling you that the emitted wavelength is inversely proportional to the absolute temperature. So now let's come back to this question, how hot is that star up there? If you look at this graph down here, here is Wien's law, lambda peak is equal to that constant B divided by T. Now as we look at hotter and hotter stars, so 3500 to 4000 to 4500 to 5000 to 5500, degrees K, we see that the peak keeps shifting. This is the famous Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which plots the luminosity, that is the amount of light which is emitted from a star, compared to the luminosity of the sun itself. And you can see that different stars of different color, so the hottest stars are the bluer ones, the coolest stars other reddish ones. The scale here is from 40,000 degrees Kelvin down to about 2,000 degrees Kelvin and most stars lie on this main sequence over here. Stars which are extremely small but extremely hot, these are called white dwarfs. On the other hand, the giants and the supergiant stars are very, very big in size. They also radiate a lot of energy, but their temperatures range from here to here. Our sun lies somewhere over here. Let's look at our sun in a little more detail. I shall assume over here that the sun is a perfectly black body radiator. Now, is this a good assumption to make? It almost is maybe to the level of 99%. Now let's work out this problem assuming that the sun is a perfect black body radiator. So suppose that per square meter, every second, about 1400 watts of solar radiation reaches the earth. We are asked to find the temperature of the sun given that the radius of the sun is 7 times 10 to the power 5 kilometers, the radius of the earth is 6.4 times 10 to the power 3 kilometers, so this makes it 100 times smaller than the sun in radius. Let's assume that the distance of the sun from the earth is 1.5 times 10 to the power 8 kilometers, and now let's see how to work out this problem. The power radiated by the sun is, of course, the area of the sun, which is 4 pi radius of the sun squared, times the power radiated by a perfect black body, 
Now this power is radiated equally in all directions and so by energy conservation the total received power at distance RSE will be 1400, that's the figure over here, watts per meter squared times the area of the sphere whose radius is RSE. So this product is equal to P which is 4 pi r sun squared times sigma t to the 4 sun. From here it is obvious that t to the power 4 will then be 1400 divided by sigma times the ratio of r s e squared to r sun squared. And so then we need to take the fourth root which is over here. If we put in the value of sigma mentioned earlier what we find is 5803 degrees Kelvin. What's the actual observed temperature of the sun? Well, not too different from that. That's 5778. And we shouldn't be surprised because after all the sun is not a perfect black body. And of course, this 1400 is an approximation. The earth is also not a perfect black body. But given the assumptions this result over here is quite nicely consistent with the result over here. Next, with the above incident energy flux meaning 1400 watts of solar radiation estimate the temperature of the earth. So what we have is that per square meter of the earth we are receiving this much radiation and of course exactly that amount of radiation per square meter has to be sent back into space otherwise the temperature of the earth would keep rising and rising and it would become impossible to sustain life. So looking over here that radiation is falling on a cross-sectional area which is pi into the radius of the earth squared that's the cross-section which is presented to the radiation that's going from the sun to the earth and now that has to equal the total amount of radiation that is emitted by the earth. Now here I've assumed that the earth is at a uniform temperature and that's because the oceans and the air they make the earth more or less at the same temperature throughout the day. So given that assumption the total power that is received by the earth is equal to the total power emitted by the earth and so that is the amount of power radiated per square meter multiplied by the entire surface area of the earth which is 4 pi radius of the earth squared. The rest of course is easy we put in the value of sigma and we get the temperature of the earth as being 280 degrees Kelvin which is 7 degrees centigrade which is not a very good result it should be more or less like 15 degrees centigrade. So what was inaccurate over here? Well of course we can't take the earth to be a perfect black body because the oceans and the atmosphere they reflect part of the radiation that comes in and so there's a much more intricate balance of energies that's involved. Still for a first guess that's not such a bad result. Now using that same principle we can ask what would be the temperature of a planet which is about nine times further away from the sun than the earth. Now that's pretty trivially done because we know that the intensity of the radiation goes down as the square of the distance from the sun and so we would simply have to reduce the amount of power received by the earth by the square of 9 which is 81. From here we immediately discover that the temperature of that planet which is nine times further away will be only three times smaller. If we want to look at more astrophysical phenomena then we'll have to talk about the photon gas. Now this is both similar to and different from the ideal gas of atoms that we've been considering so far. So in this ideal gas we have atoms that are confined by walls. These are you could say potential wells in which these atoms move. 
On the other hand, we have photons moving at the speed of light inside this box. Now let's look at the similarities and the differences between a photon gas and an ideal gas of atoms. First, in this ideal gas of atoms there are no atom-atom collisions. That is to say, these atoms collide only with the walls of the container. These walls confine the atoms. However, these atoms do not collide with each other, ideally. Of course, if they do, then it becomes a real gas, not an ideal gas. On the other hand, in a gas of photons, since photons do not collide with each other, therefore, almost by definition, a photon gas is an exact ideal gas of photons. Why don't photons collide with each other the way that atoms do? Well, that follows from quantum electrodynamics and quantum electrodynamics is very exact on this. Next, these atoms are confined by walls and the number of atoms is fixed. On the other hand, in a photon gas, the photons are created by the hot walls. So on these hot walls are atoms. These atoms are vibrating, colliding with each other. The colliding and accelerating electrons are charges that radiate off photons. As you increase the temperature of the radiating walls, the number of photons inside increases. In fact, even at a constant temperature, n is always changing. Of course, it has a certain average number, and the deviation from that average is small. However, keep in mind that this is very different from this, where n is fixed. Next, another fundamental difference. In an ideal gas of atoms, such as at normal temperatures and pressures, the speed of the atoms is small. These atoms are non-relativistic. On the other hand, photons always move at the speed of light, and so the energy inside this is always in purely relativistic form. Equally, I could say that the energy of each particle over here is half its mass into the square of its velocity. But for a photon, the energy of a single photon is its frequency, omega, multiplied by Planck's constant. Some people, of course, like to write it as h nu rather than h bar omega, but they're exactly the same. Because h bar is h over 2 pi and omega is 2 pi nu. If we look at the total internal energy of this ideal gas of atoms, well, that is simply 3 over 2, the number of atoms, times Boltzmann's constant. And so if you looked at U per atom, that would simply be 3 over 2 Kb into T. And most importantly, this doesn't depend upon the volume. That's because these never collide with each other. Of course, if it's a real gas, then you will have some amount of volume dependence. For a photon gas, however, we'll have to do a little more work to get the internal energy U. So here is the Planck formula that you've seen many times over. We will have to integrate over all omega, in which case we will get the internal energy of the photon gas. Now here there's a big, big difference because to get the energy of all the photons in this box, we'll have to integrate over the entire volume of the box. And so therefore the internal energy U will be proportional to the volume as well. And so if you integrate epsilon of omega over omega, you get U is V times B T to the 4 with B being this constant over here. This integral over omega is actually quite easy to do, but I won't do it here. The important thing is that the energy inside a cavity is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature, and this is very much like the Stefan-Boltzmann law. But of course, the Stefan-Boltzmann law 
concerns the radiated energy from a black body. Here, what we have is the internal energy of photons confined within a volume V. For both the ideal gas and the photon gas, we can look at the specific heats. So, the specific heat at constant volume, which is defined as du by dt at constant V, well, obviously from here, since V doesn't even enter the picture, Cv is 3 over 2 nKb. On the other hand, for a photon gas, Cv is directly proportional to the volume. When we differentiate this factor, we get simply 4b t cubed. So the point is that the bigger the volume you have, the greater the specific heat. That's because more volume means more photons. As you add in energy, you create more photons inside this box. What about pressure? We know that in a gas of atoms, we have atoms that collide with the walls of the container and when they collide, they transfer momentum onto it, which means that there's a force. So these atoms are constantly striking the sides of the container and that's why we have this pressure which simply follows from the gas equation PV is equal to NKBT. You put NKBT from here as two-thirds of U then the product of the pressure and the volume of an ideal gas of atoms is two-thirds the internal energy. For a photon gas, it's actually very, very similar. But here, the product of P and V is one-third of the internal energy U. Now, if I take U from here and put it in here, then I simply get P is equal to one-third a constant, into t to the power 4. So here, the volume completely drops out of the pressure. Of course, you could ask the question, why do photons, which don't carry any mass, still exert a pressure upon the radiating walls which have produced them? The answer is very simple because each one of these photons is actually moving and it's moving at the speed of light. It's carrying momentum and so when it collides with the walls of the container, the walls experience a force due to the collision of that photon. So, funny as it sounds, if I take an empty box and I simply heat it, then from within that box, the photons that are rushing about inside want to make that box expand. And this fact is going to be very important when we talk about the expanding universe. Finally, I want to discuss the thermodynamics of the Big Bang. The Big Bang which led to the expanding universe. That Big Bang created photons in a small spherical volume whose radius subsequently expanded with time. So this led to cooling of the radiation. Let's assume the expansion is adiabatic. What adiabatic means over here is that the rate of expansion is sufficiently small, that the universe is in equilibrium at every instant of time, or you could say that the entropy is constant. We are asked to find the relation between the temperature of the universe and its radius r. Let's begin from the first law of thermodynamics which says that the change in the internal energy is equal to the amount of heat that's put in and that dq is Tds for something that is sufficiently slow, something that is adiabatic, so Tds minus Pdv. Pdv is the amount of work that is done by the system, in this case by the photons that are pushing outwards. Now, since this is an adiabatic expansion, then the entropy is constant. And that's because we saw from the second law of thermodynamics that the entropy of an isolated system can never decrease. At best, it can remain constant, and it will remain constant if the expansion is adiabatic. 
So from du equals t ds minus pd, v above, once we put ds equal to zero, then of course this is just minus p dv, but we put p over here as u over 3v. And now it's very easy to write this in the following form is du over u, which is minus one third dv over v. And now it's only a matter of calculus. Let's integrate both sides. Then we get integral of du over u is log of u. Integral of dv over v is log of v. And this minus one third can be accommodated by just putting it to the power minus one third. Of course, there's an additive constant as well, plus c. And so if I differentiate this side and this side, of course, the constant goes out. And this becomes exactly the same as this. Now, of course, this is entirely equivalent to this. What we found is that u is proportional to 1 over v to the power 1 third. That is to say, as the volume of the universe increases, the energy, the internal energy of the photon gas decreases proportionately. However, we've just seen that for a photon gas, this U is a constant B times the volume V times the temperature to the power 4. And so what we find is that V T to the power 4 is proportional to v to the power minus one third. We can write this slightly differently as v to the power one third into t. The whole to the power four is a constant, but that means that v to the one third into t is a constant. However, v is the volume of the universe, which is four over three pi r cubed. And so v is proportional to r cubed in which case we get this very, very important result that the temperature of the universe decreases as R increases. So in our way of thinking, the photon gas is cooling because of the expansion of the spherical volume. This is reasoning that is based purely on thermodynamics. However, this is exactly consistent with the result that comes from general relativity, because in general relativity, it is space-time that is expanding. In particular, as space expands, the wavelength increases and the energy decreases. This is exactly what we have over here, that the internal energy of the photon gas then goes down as 1 over r. As the internal energy goes down, the temperature also goes down, and so this result from thermodynamics is the same that we get from Einstein's theory of general relativity.